Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Tom Fuller, uh, I work in the policy companies for my career. I've been at mine for about two and a half years now, and uh, the reason I wanted to work there was because uh, one university I experienced mental health problems myself. Uh, I started there, and lasted for a few years, it was a pretty unpleasant experience, but I was fortunate enough to have uh, friends and family around me who were supportive and understanding. Uh, I was fortunate to be in a financial position where I wasn't a threat of falling into poverty and debt. Uh, following on from what Diane talked about, I was fortunate enough to be in a you know, cultural and ethnic group that doesn't face discrimination in the health system. Uh, and ultimately, I was fortunate enough to have access to the sort of support which helped to recover from the mental health problem. Uh, so, although those problems subsided for me, uh, I was left with the feeling that it was deeply unfair that people who facing similar problems in different circumstances and had a very different experience to me and ultimately might not recover from that. And I wanted to find a way that I could work towards ensuring that people from all backgrounds and in any circumstances would receive the support and respect they needed. Uh, and also to try and operate a society where there wasn't stigma and discrimination for people with mental health problems. Uh, I feel like I'm able to do that to work with mine with a leading mental health charity in England and Wales. Uh, we've been campaigning for mental health football for over 60 years now. We also deliver local services uh, through a network of 160 uh, independent local lines. Uh, and our vision is that we won't give up until everyone experiences a mental health problem gets both support and respect. So, as I said, I work in the policy campaigns team, and in particular uh, in a team that focuses on social inclusion and rights. Uh, so, we're essentially looking at what the barriers that society puts in the way of someone with a mental health problem leading their full and fulfilled life. Uh, and the two key areas we're focusing on at the moment. Uh, our welfare, so benefits, back to work support, and also the flip side of that being employment and what does a mental health and workplace look like, how can employers effectively support mental health. Uh, we're very much informed in our policy campaigns work by the people we represent. So in the presentation, I'll be looking from the perspective of someone with mental health problems. Um, I'll be asking this question, which is, what does the journey back into work look like for someone with mental health problems? Uh, now, obviously, this journey will look and feel different for different people. So for some people, it may be that they're only out of work for a short period, they have support around me like I was able to have, which means I can get back into work quickly. For others, it will take longer. It won't be a linear or a steady journey. Some people will take steps forward and steps back. Um, but for us, these are some of the vital components that for a lot of people will make up that journey back to work. And if they work right, would be a really effective support mechanism for getting people into that journey back to work. Um, so I'll be going through each of these areas, seeking advice and support for uh, access to the benefit system, actually access to those benefits, uh, receiving back to work support through the welfare system, potentially receiving support to transition into work and stay in work, and then finally, once you're in work, what does a mental health and work person look like? Um, and in each of these areas, we feel that there's huge potential, like I say, to help people on that journey, but there's also huge problems currently with the way the system's operating. So I'll go through each of those in turn. So first of all, um, seeking advice. So if we assume that we're starting from a position of someone who's fallen out of work because of a mental health problem, uh, ultimately they'd like to return to work, but they feel like they're a long way from that at the moment, uh, and they're experiencing financial difficulty because of that loss of employment. If, if someone came to mind in that position, we'd always advise them to seek advice from a uh, welfare advice service, something like the Citizens Advice Bureau, or some local minds to deliver this service. Uh, why do we do this? Well. The benefit system is extremely complicated. Uh, it really helps to have someone on your side who understands that system, who knows how to navigate it on your behalf. Uh, particularly for people with mental health problems, that's an issue because there can be real issues around being able to self advocate. So people may face problems with uh, socialising, they may face problems in communicating their condition and the impact it has on them. Uh, and they may also have issues around motivation and confidence. So the welfare advice service can help to advocate on behalf of that person. We also believe it provides a really valuable filtering system, both in terms of directing that person to the right benefit that's most appropriate for them, but also uh, in terms of helping the state to avoid having lots of applications for benefits that are appropriate to ensure that when those applications go in, they're well, they're well uh, filled in. Uh, so we think ultimately it probably saves the government enough money to have this system in place. And ultimately, you've just got a greater chance of success in getting the benefits you need if you've got that support in your side. Uh, however, at the moment, these services are under strain and under threat. Uh, local authorities across the country are being forced to make uh, significant cuts, and many of these cuts are coming from uh, advice services. Next year, changes to legal aid funding will kick in, which will also uh, take a lot of funding away from these services. And alongside this, there's increased demand for the services, so uh, both because people are falling out of work, but also because there have been significant changes in the benefit system over the last few years, uh, which should make more people seeking this sort of support. 
And this increase in demand will only grow going forward as further changes to the development system kick in over the next few years. We also feel from our perspective that there is a lack of mental health expertise in the system. There are some really good uh, mental health specific advice services offered by local minds, read things, uh, and some centres as advice bureau. But in general, because this is such a large group, <coughs> we feel there needs to be a greater spread of mental health expertise to ensure that those advisors know how to communicate with those people, know how to ensure that they put their case across effectively. But if we assume that someone has been able to access that sort of advice and support uh, and then decide that they're going to apply for a kind of work benefit uh, because of their illness or disability, which type of benefit you get at that point is also a really important matter. So the first issue is just the cold hard cash, you know, the level of income you get is really important. If you're going to be out of work for a longer time because of disability compared to someone without, without that barrier, uh, then it only seems fair that you receive a greater level of support and also you're likely to face additional costs because of your disability. Uh, the type of benefit you get is also important in terms of the back to work support you get. So as well as that, the financial support, there's the practical support to get, to get back to work and the expectations and requirements that pop on you as part of receiving that benefit. So again, it's really important that people are getting the benefit that best suits their needs and their values. Um, and finally, the time scales that are expected of you to get back to work will be different from the benefit to the amount of time you can claim that benefit for. So again, it's really vital that people are getting the benefit that suits them best. Uh, we don't feel the system's working fairly and effectively. Uh, it's probably the issue we get the most contact out of mind from people uh, going through the benefit system, uh, particularly issues around the work and the assessment are huge at the moment. So over recent years there's been a raised threshold for access and disability benefits uh, and those benefits also have higher expectations on people. So it's harder to get onto disability benefits and once you're on them there's more expected of you and there's harsher punishments if you don't meet those expectations. Uh, as well as the way the system is designed, there's the way it's being delivered, there's the sort of tone and style of the assessment delivered by Access Healthcare. And again we've got substantial problems here. Um, the way it's being delivered is causing a huge amount of stress and anxiety for people with mental health problems. That's partly because uh, we don't feel there's enough, again, enough mental health expertise within access to ensure that people are treated in an appropriate manner and that their barriers and needs are taken into full account. And ultimately, there's just too many wrong decisions. Huge numbers of people are with turning people work decisions in the tribunal. Uh, and we believe that there are many more who, because they don't have access to the sort of advice and support I was talking about earlier, may just fall through the gap. So maybe they get a fit for work decision, uh, they don't feel able to challenge it because they don't have that support behind them. So they go into the wrong benefit, maybe they go into job seekers' allowance. Uh, they can't cope with the requirements that are put on them as part of that benefit. So maybe they either fall out of the system or they're sanctioned, and then they're left with no support at all. And we think this is probably a big problem, and it's a hidden problem because it's hard to, to keep track of those people. Um, job seekers' allowance is a benefit for people who are essentially ready to work now. So if you receive a fifth work position as someone who has mental health problems and faces additional barriers because of that, those two benefits just don't match, those two factors just don't match up. And ultimately the, the work of the assessment is really the linchpin at the moment of the benefit system for people with disabilities and illness. Uh, so if the decisions are being made wrong at this point, it undermines the progress of the system going forward. But again, we'll assume that someone uh, has managed to negotiate that system, they've gone through the work capability assessment, and let's say they've been put in this middle group, the work capability activity group. So basically the system's recognising that you face additional barriers because you've got a mental health problem, you're not ready to work now, but given the right time, given the right support, you could get back into work. Um, so the first thing to say is that mine is totally clear that we believe work can be good for mental health, uh, and we want to see many more people with mental health problems get back into work. However, the work is good for you message has been a bit simplistically used uh, in some, in some parts uh, over the last few years. So we know that the right sort of work, uh, access with the right sort of support is certainly good for mental health. But there's also research that shows that work that's not supportive or work that's inappropriate can be as bad for mental health as not working at all. So there needs to be more nuanced type message about what's good for you. Uh, it's not as simple as putting anyone, anyone into any job. Uh, we know that good models of support do exist, uh, and I think Later on, uh, mental, health, mental health will be talking about the IPS model, which we know is really effective. And there's loads of potential here for you know, really supportive and personalised approaches to be developed after there to be a good uh, sharing of practice around that. Uh, and to find something that really works, rather than sometimes starting from a position of assuming uh, people need to be pushed back to work. Maybe it's more about working out how best we can support people back to work. Uh, we think there are currently significant problems with the back to work system. It's predominantly delivered, delivered through the work programme. Uh, as with the benefit system, we think there's a lack of mental health expertise there. Uh, there's this black box approach that providers essentially allowed to do whatever they think works, 
but we don't know whether the people uh, advising their clients within the work program have the expertise to ensure that the things they're asking people to do, to do are appropriate and that they understand the barriers that person is facing. We think there's too much of a focus on conditionality and sanctions in the system. We think it sets a tone for engagement, which many people mental health problems can find hard to cope with. It says from the start that basically it's assumed that you don't want to engage, but we need to force you to do so. And actually, our experience is that can push people further away from the job market rather than help them to support and foster them towards the job market. We know also that providers within the work program are facing difficulty, particularly for small and third sector providers. They're struggling to make enough money out of the system to stay afloat. Uh, and finally, it's just a really difficult time to be looking for a job, uh, even if you don't face traditional barriers because of a mental health problem. So it's going to be a really hard time to help them back into work. Uh, also, some of the more controversial elements of the back to work system, like welfare, have undermined it in some people's hearts. But again, taking a positive stance, we're assuming that someone has gone through that system, they on the verge of going back into work. Uh, but finding a job is not the end of the process because many people will need a, a specific support to transition into work and they may need support once they're going to work to stay in work. Uh, we think there's great potential for this support to come from Access to Work, which is a fund the government runs uh, to help people, disabled people stay in work. Uh, especially now there is a specific contract to focus on mental health, which has been delivered through Roundway. If, if used right, this Access to Work fund could help people to transition into work, it could help them stay in work. It could fund things like uh, helping someone with a support worker, funding specific types of transport for that person, or even covering sickness outcomes. Uh, at the moment, however, Access to Work has a fairly poor record when it comes to mental health. Last year, only 1% of the budget for Access to Work went on mental health. Uh, it's partly because there's simply more obvious ways in which it can be used for physical health. So, you know, physical wheelchair, for example, is a fairly obvious use. It's harder to see how you might use it for mental health. So we need more innovation in that area. But also because until now, there just hasn't been enough emphasis on helping that group of people. We think there's also a need to be able to guarantee access to that funding uh, before you get the job. So at the moment, that fund is only available once you've secured a job for mental health. But we feel if that funding was available and guaranteed before you went for that job, that would give people greater confidence to go for job applications. And it may also provide a way of reassuring employers that uh, the additional cost that might be incurred as a result of employing someone with a long term health condition can be supported by the state. So every step of the journey until this point has been basically provided by the state, but once someone gets into work, uh, we need employers to also step up to the mark and ensure that they're creating workplaces that are mentally healthy uh, and that they're supporting people who do have mental health problems. We think there are simple steps that can be taken to make, mentally, to make workplaces more mentally healthy, such as ensuring that all employees get a proper lunch break, and this can make a big difference uh, to the well-being of staff. There's good advice and resources out there, for employers, uh, such as those produced uh, as part of our Taking Care of Business campaign, which can uh, help uh, employers to ensure they can support people with mental health problems effectively. And we think that mentally healthy workplace is good for all staff, not just those with mental health problems. So there's evidence to show that having a workplace which is mentally healthy can help productivity and is be better for the business or organisation. So we believe there's a business case to be made, there's a legal case because of the Equality Act, and also there's a moral case to be made for ensuring that uh, workplaces are mentally healthy and employers to support people with mental health problems. And it's not a niche issue, and it's not something that we load out as a priority for employers or government. It places a huge cost uh, on the economy, so a percent of mental health are estimated the annual cost in terms of absence, reduced productivity, staff turnover, as a result of the mental health, it's around 26 billion a year to the UK economy. It's not something that only affects a small number of people. One in six workers reported uh, being affected by conditions like anxiety, uh, depression, and unmanageable stress. And also, work can play a role in creating mental health problems. So, 5 million workers said they felt very or extremely stressed as a result of their work, and half a million believed it was actually making them ill. We don't think enough is being done by employers to address this issue, so if only 8 in 10, sorry, 8 in 10 employers did not have a specific mental health policy to ensure that staff were being supported. And stigma and discrimination in the workplace is a huge issue. Uh, we know that only four in ten employers will take on someone with a declared mental health condition. So getting into the workplace, to in some extent, uh, could be the end of someone's journey, but also if it's not handled properly and that workplace isn't supportive to them, it could be the beginning of another journey where they fall out of work again and go through the whole cycle again. 
So this is what the whole journey looks like at the moment from our perspective. Within the, I'd say that within this huge amount of potential for this to be an effective mechanism to support it back into work, but there's a huge amount of work to be done in these areas within the work properly. One thing I haven't mentioned until now, uh, and I'm sure this is something that will be of particular interest to you, is how the system interacts with people's health support. Uh, essentially, we feel there isn't enough of a connection between the support someone receives to help them recover from the mental health problem and the support they'll be receiving alongside that to help them get back into work. So when it comes to advice services, there can be better signposting between health and advice services and vice versa. When it comes to the benefit system, uh, there simply isn't enough notice taken of someone's health and social care professionals when it comes to deciding eligibility for benefits. Back to work support is often treated as an entirely separate process from someone's health support and can actually lead to contradictory advice being based on that person. And sometimes, uh, and once someone's in work, uh, mental health support really tends to kick in once someone is experiencing a significant problem and we feel there could be more work to be done to ensure that health professionals are helping people within work to stay mentally healthy and to avoid problems. Uh, if someone's out of work because of a mental health problem, then the support they're receiving to recover from that mental health problem and the support they're receiving to get back into work, if that's appropriate at that time, should be intertwined and connected and complementary. And we don't think that's happening at the moment. Uh, in terms of making the system better as a whole, the work we're doing in mind is focusing on two main areas. So we're campaigning for improvements to the welfare benefit system, uh, doing a lot of work around work capability assessment, but also trying to ensure there's advice available for people, trying to ensure the back-to-work support's working effectively, looking at alternative models of back-to-work support, and also working with employers employed and employees to try and ensure that the workplaces are more mentally healthy and people within those workplaces who do have mental health are being supported. Uh, you can find out more about the work we're doing by going to our website. Uh, you can get to me directly if you have any questions. I think it's probably a bit of time now. Questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, that's certainly a very comprehensive account of uh, the elements to uh, get people back into work uh, from the mental health problem. So that's great, very comprehensive. Thank you. I mean, there are a number of issues there, and um, you know, credit to you and mine and others, organisations, to keep me focused on this, because the things are quite stacked up against us in many respects, but that is always the time to work harder, to yeah. try and make sure that you get people back to it. Because we said, you know, it, 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 um, employment, appropriate work, paid work, is good uh, for your mental health. We all know that. So, um, can you just let me know if you'd like to ask a question? Um, so there's one there. So, any others? Um, no, so we'll, we'll come to you, sir. So question here. Um, just question here. Okay. That's it, no, the microphone's coming, that's good. And, and also, um, but one of the things, Tom, you mentioned throughout the presentation was a lack of mental health expertise. That seems to be getting in the way. Uh, but when you finish our term first, can you just say a little bit about that and what you would want to be put in place? Sure. Uh, hello, my name is Greg Smith, and I'm a policy analyst at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, we've been uh, working a lot on parity of esteem recently uh, with the mental health firm uh, amongst others and um, I'm absolutely astounded to see that only 1% of the access to work budget is spent on mental health. That's surely a key parity issue. Uh, I wonder, uh, just for my own understanding, if you could uh, say a little bit about uh, what that 1% itself is being spent on and whether uh, to achieve parity it should be a case of scaling up that kind of um, uh, investment or if, uh, more innovative, um, I suppose, approaches are needed. Yeah, so um, I should say that that's last year's figure, now there is a specific contract for us to work for mental health to be delivered through Rental. So the hope is that because there's a specific focus on that now, that will scale up. Uh, in terms of what people are using it for, we have really have a few accounts, but it's things like um, maybe covering the cost of uh, taxis if you struggle with public transport, it could be funding and to have someone to support you in work for the first few weeks of work and potentially it could cover the additional costs that the employer faces if you think if you need to take sickness absence. But I think you're right, the innovation is a really key part of it. I think we see something across a lot of benefits and it's similar with, with DLA for a long time where uh, it's kind of assumed that these that, that these benefits and this support is for, is for physical disability and traditionally it's been more accessed by people with physical disability. Uh, and it takes a while for sort of mental health to be, well, two sides of it. It takes a while for people with mental health problems to recognise that support they can have access to. 
Uh, and it takes a while for the system to get good at understanding how it can support people mental health problems. And it, it is sort of developing but from both sides. Part of it's about publicising it, it's just not very well known, it's often described as the government's best kept secret. Um, giving people ideas about how they could use it would be, would be a good way forward. Yeah, and basically innovating within that fund so, so that uh, there's a great understanding of how that fund can support people. So much the question at the back there. Challenge for the others, the microphones. Hi, um, I'm Mary Dunleavy from the Access to Work programme. Um, so we are at the back of the hall and happy to talk to you about various ways in which we can spread the news. And part of what we've been doing over the last 12 months is going out and talking to a whole variety of organisations, including um, the psychiatrist about the program and how it can be used. It's very flexible, as Tom said, and it can be used in a number of ways to support people with mental health back to work. Um, we are listening, so if you come up with better ways, we'll certainly look at them. But um, if you come and talk to us at the back of the room, we'll certainly take the details and be happy to talk to you further about the program. Thank you. Thank you for making yourself known. That was great. And the question right next to you. Chris Beeching, I'm Chief Exec of Tom Gerard's Mental Health Resource. We provide social care and support for around 450, 500 um, services with mental health issues, uh, delivered through three projects. Um, one of the stumbling blocks we've come across repeatedly is a historical diagnosis by a GP with then the uh, mop-up phrase, don't worry, you'll never have to work again. Um, unfortunately, in our local job centre, the disability employment advisor no longer exists, and Kent Supported Employment, though very willing, has extremely limited experience of getting people with mental health issues back into the workplace. We've now had to take some of our very precious core funding and set up partnership agreements with local businesses on a well, if you've got somebody who's starting to buckle, refer them to us rather than the GP. We'll do that side of things. And if we've got somebody work ready, we'll do a swap for a while and see whether that works. That surely can't be the best answer. There must be something else that can happen. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, go back to the first thing you said, there's, there's a really interesting issue here because for a long time there was a problem, and there probably still is a problem, like you say, with GPs and to some extent the mental health system in general, in general, sorry. Um, setting low aspirations for people and, 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 and that sort of assumption that yeah you've got you've got to sit myself on so you won't work again. And so for a long time organisations like mine were calling for greater efforts to be made to help people back to work. Um, but in a way that pendulum swung from sort of the I the incapacity benefit situation where people were just double <coughs> and, and left to this it's almost swung entirely the other way where people are basically being almost coerced back to work. Uh, and we don't think it's an effective way of supporting people. Um, I think you're right, there's a lot to be done about finding methods that work, but in the current situation, with, like you say, funding being cut, um, people struggling to access all sorts of support, if is going to get harder to access when it becomes personal independence payment, and social care thresholds are being raised all over the place, and it's often hard to access a social care for mental health anyway. Um, so it, it's not a great time to be trying to innovate, but at the same time, I guess innovation is sort of a necessity because of the situation where, um, but I think you're right, there is a delicate balance between making sure that healthcare professionals are part of that conversation about how people get back to work, but, but trying to do something to address this issue that has been in the past around our aspirations. Uh, I think you made some really good points, and uh, it's something that we're, we're concerned about, we're active about within the Centre for Mental Health and the wider mental health world. It reminds me of a, it reminds me of a round table we had about a year ago that was funded sponsored by New Philanthropy Capital, work commissioned by uh, Barclays Wealth. There's a report it's about really funding, you know, where, where should philanthropists and foundations put their money in in, in the world of uh, mental health? And employment uh, came out very near the top, or, or the top. And the amount here was about a lot of employers, business people, bankers, uh, people from health. Um, and we explored the notion of individual placement and support, we're going to be hearing a little bit more about that after the coffee. A model that will help address some of these issues for mental health expertise. It needs, it needs investment uh, and government's running out 
but the, the employers and businesses were at the point of thinking this might be an area that's worth investing in. So I think we need to just keep going with that message and uh, we'll see where that takes us. But um, very helpful, Tommy, it was an excellent presentation. If we could just uh, finally show our appreciation for Tom and then we'll get to the